In this next series of screencasts, we're going to look at flow networks and maximum flow problems. And we've just, just docked at Midway. Welcome to downtown Midway Mall. So in many natural problems, we need to model flow through networks, such as pipes, carrying materials, or transportation networks, trucks or trains, and communication networks. Uh, carrying bits. So we can model uh, flow from locations to locations through pipelines or conduits that have certain capacities. And flow algorithms also have applications to other problems that don't lo look like flow. We're going to see one, a matching problem, at the end of this series of screencasts. And they also have applications to scheduling, for example. So we model a flow network with a graph. It's just a weighted graph. We give each edge a capacity, which we're going to designate to be C of UV. And uh, we're going to say that if the edge is not, if an edge is not in the network, then its capacity is zero. Uh, if an edge is in the network, we do not allow the reverse edge. So given this edge here, we are not allowed to have this reverse edge here. Shortly, I'll show you how to um, model a network that does have reverse edges with one that does not. And this simplifies the algorithms. And we designate one vertex S to be the start vertex and another vertex T to be the target or sink in graph terminology. And we're going to assume that all vertices lie on some path from a source to a sink. So of course it's a connected graph and a vertex that doesn't lie on such a path can't participate in any flow so we can just ignore them if they're there. So we'll just assume that they're all on a path from, from S to T. So this is a simple example here with a trucking network that, you know, you, if you had trucks that can carry a certain amount of stuff between cities and you've modeled the flow with it. Now we need to give flow a formal definition. So a flow for a network will be a function, f, that maps edges, v cross v is always the edges, to real numbers. For example, here it's given a flow of uh, 11 to this edge here. And to be a legal flow, it has to satisfy these two constraints. Uh, the capacity constraint says for all pairs of vertices, in other words, all edges, the flow assigned to that edge is at least zero and at no more than the capacity. So obviously you can't um, push more over an edge than its capacity is. Flow conservation says for all vertices except for the source in the sink, the flow coming from other vertices V into U must equal to the flow coming out of you to the two other vertices. So in other words, the flow into a vertex must equal flow out of it, except for the source in the sink. So here, for example, uh, let's check that this graph is, the flow in this graph is respecting flow conservation. Let's look at the vertices. Uh, say vertex 3 has 12 going into it and 7 going into it, that's 19. It's got 15 and 4 going out, that's also 19. Vertex 2, for example, has again 4 and 8 going into it, 12, 11 and 1, 12 going out. So that meets flow conservation. Now let's define the value of a flow. F with the bars around it will be the value of the flow. So F is a function that maps numbers to all the edges. It's kind of a complex object, where F, whereas F with bars around it is a single number, the value of the flow. And that value of the flow will be the total amount of flow going from S out to other vertices minus the total amount of flow coming from other vertices back into S. So essentially, this is going to be the net flow that gets out of S and doesn't come back. And it actually will go to T by flow conservation. So we might ask whether we're making maximum use of the possible flow capacity for this network. And that is the maximum flow problem. Uh, given a graph, a start, a target, capacities, find a flow f whose value is maximum. So for example, in this network we see we've got this edge to capacity, but this edge is not the capacity. So is there a way we can get more capacity over this edge? So we will return to that problem. Let's look next at some excluded variations and how to deal with them. First of all, we don't allow anti-parallel edges, like these here. This is not allowed with by our algorithms. So how can we eliminate that? Well, why don't we just 
subtract the smaller from the larger and turn that into six, say. Well, that doesn't, that actually restricts the problem too much. It doesn't model the fact that you could actually shove 10 units here and 10 down here. And uh, also completely eliminates the fact that you can move units up that way if you have to. So that's not good enough. So this is how we deal with it. We just add a new vertex, V prime, and we give it the flow going in one direction, and then we can keep the other one going the other direction. And now we've met the requirements of not having anti-parallel edges, and we're still modeling the original network correctly. We just have to keep track that this V prime is not a real destination. Another excluded variation that's very easy to deal with is that we can't have multiple sources and sinks like we have here. But that's easy because we can just add a, a single source and a single sink and then make them have infinite flow from all of the other sources and sinks. See these have label infinite on them. So next we're going to look at some graph theory, but first a brief interlude. We're on Midway, where of course this famous battle was fought. And if you walk around, there's some decaying buildings that were at the center of the battle and various artifacts left over from the military presence. Let's now look at a little bit of graph theory terminology that we're going to use in talking about flow algorithms. Um, crucial concept of a cut. A cut is just a partition of the vertices into two sets, S and T, where S includes the source vertex and T includes the sink or target vertex. And so for example, a cut here is a cut right here where S is in this set of vertices and T is in this set of vertices. Now we define the net flow across a cut to be the sum of the actual flow from vertices in S to vertices in U minus the flow coming back from vertices in T back to vertices in S. So that gives you the net flow across the, the cut, accounting for what might be coming back. Example here, net flow across the cut, we got 12 going forward here, 11 going forward here, but we got 4 coming back. So that's 19. And notice that's the same as what's here, 19. Now the capacity of a cut, we just add up the capacity of the edges that go from the S side to the T side. We do not subtract uh, any capacity coming back. So for here, we would just look at 12 and 14. We do not subtract the 9 to get the capacity across that cut. And why is that important? Well, capacity is going to tell us what we can potentially, at least with respect to that particular slice of the graph, get from the part of the graph that has the source in it to the part of the graph that has the sink in it. Whereas the flow tells us what we've actually been successful in getting from one side of the graph to the other. And you have to subtract what you uh, were getting back. Now a minimum cut, we can have multiple cuts and they can have different values of um, capacity. So minimum cut is a cut whose capacity is minimum over all the cuts of G. And you might imagine now that this is going to be pretty important. So here's another example graph. Uh, we're going to look at the cut S, W, Y, so it's these three vertices are in one set, and T is X, Z, T, these three other vertices are in another set, of course shown by the line. Uh, the flow across the cut will be the sum of the flows of the edges that cross the cut, so that's W, X, and Y, Z, minus the flow that comes backwards, which is goes X, Y, so that's 2 plus 2 right here minus one coming back is three for the flow whereas the cut we're just going to add up the capacity of the edges going forward so that's two plus three which is five so notice that the flow and the cut are different now we're looking at the same graph but a different cut this cut will have more vertices in the s side s w x and y are all in the s side and in the T side, we have Z and T, these two vertices. So now we have the flow will be the two edges crossing this cut forward, X to T and Y to Z. So the flow is 2 plus 2, but we've got to subtract what's coming back, this 1 here. So we get 2 plus 2 minus 1. Uh, again, we get 3 for the flow. But then the, for the uh, cut here, 
we're going to look forward only. 3 plus 3 gives us 6. Now notice that that's a different value than that one. So different cuts have different capacities. We can shove 6 across this cut, but we can only shove 5 across this cut. So you can imagine that the minimum cut is the one that's going to be more important. Again, the minimum cut is a cut whose capacity is minimum over all cuts of G because being able to put six units over this cut doesn't really help us if we can only get five across this other one. We're going to treat that more formally with a theorem. But that theorem will be in the next screencast. Right now we're going to just mention a few useful facts. And uh, the, we're not doing any proofs today. The proofs are all easy to understand and straightforward, but they involve writing a lot of summations and just doing basic algebraic manipulations to turn one expression into another. Uh, so just read those in the text if you want to see the proofs. But first we have this lemma. For any cut ST, the flow across the cut is the flow of the network. So that says the current flow of the network can't be greater or less than the flow of the, any cut that we've drawn. And notice in the previous example we did two cuts that had different capacities but both of them had flow 3. So essentially if you got flow going through a network and you took a big machete and whacked your way through all the pipes, it doesn't matter where you whack, the same amount of stuff's going to come out. So the corollary of this is that the capacity of any cut is an upper bound of the value of any flow. And of course that will imply that if we find the minimum capacity cut we've found the, the minimum upper bound on the value of any flow. We're going to leave further development of these ideas to the next screencast where we introduce the Ford Fulkerson method and algorithm and return back to the ship where in the evening David Litschwager is photographing a very large triton that he's put in, in his uh, aquarium and there was a lot of excitement people said after several hours it was finally coming out and starting to explore its environment. And he's got some great pictures of this in his book with Susan Middleton. So that concludes our first day on Midway and our introduction to flow networks and the maximum flow problem.